Well, good morning, everyone. Well, it's good to see you guys today. I hope that the Lord's been uh, blessing you as we've been going through Genesis. We're reaching the end here. So uh, it's, it's a little like we're gathered for a funeral today because we're going to be in chapter 49, which uh, Jacob dies. So we are gathered here, beloved. I feel like I should put on my, my preacher voice and say a little something at the funeral. The interesting thing is, Jacob knows that he's dying. And he's already blessed Joseph's two sons. If you remember, as he was leaning on top of his, he gets himself up in bed and he's leaning on his staff, which he's had with him for a long time, I'm sure. And he blesses Ephraim and Manasseh and he does the whole switch thing. And so we've gotten to see him do that, but he's got to say goodbye to the other sons. And he's got 12. So it's like a really long chapter with a lot of deep things in it. So we'll be here for about two and a half hours. <laughs> I will cut short. So uh, there may be things that you say, well, why didn't you say this or why didn't you say that? It's because people have to eat <laughs> pretty much. Mostly me. But we're going to look at the passing of a great man, the patriarch of the family, the one who God has renamed Israel, although he doesn't quite take the name fully. And so we're going to, we're going to look at the, the uh, final two chapters, not two chapters today. We're just going to look at one. Last week, we saw Ephraim and Manasseh getting blessed, Joseph's children's, and he's uh we talked about the, the stages of life, the seven stages of life, the spills, the drills, the thrills, the bills, the ills, the pills, and the wills. So I'm in the pills section. My wife always reminds me, did you take your vitamin? <laughs> Let's take my vitamin. And so he, he blesses them, and he's going to do something completely different here. He's going to adopt his two children, his grandchildren, as his children. So they will be included in the inheritance. And it's a way of him giving a double blessing to Joseph. And if you remember, it's the eldest that gets the double blessing. It's the rule of the firstborn. And so it's a position, not necessarily an order of your birth. So we saw that um, going in. And we looked at the 12 tribes. And, and now how many tribes do we really have? Well, you have 12 sons. And then you have Ephraim and Manasseh which if I count right, that makes 14. So why is it throughout the scripture, it only lists 12 tribes whenever you see them listed? And we answered that last week, so you guys know. Anyway, we looked at the number 12 and how many things there are that are 12 throughout the scriptures and how many things that are 12 just, you know. Um, so, you know, he's got basically a baker's dozen here because Joseph is no longer going to be part of the inheritance. It's going to be his children. And so uh, that, that's how we get that. Anyway, Israel is now adopting them. And we see that he has a very different focus. He's, he has a much more God-centered focus than he's had before. It's one of those things that tends to settle in towards the end of your life. And it's energy that you don't have, but it's wisdom that you do have. You, you follow what I'm saying? I wish I knew the things that I know now, but I was as young as I used to be when I was stupid. You guys know what that's like? You gain wisdom over a period of time, but then you don't have the energy. You know, I, I, I watch little kids that are jumping around and spinning around for no reason whatsoever, just because they have an excess of energy. You wish you could, like, tap just the extra and, and drink it or something. It's like I always say, youth is wasted on the young. And wisdom comes way too slowly. But he has a different focus, and he's now going to bless others. Now, here's a handicapped guy who's blind in bed, and he's blessing others. So what's your excuse? I feel like I can do so much more. How about you? Yes. When I, get, when I see the Risdens come in and tell us what they're doing and 
and I see my brother get up on the stage and all the trouble that he has, I think, my goodness, I don't have to do half of the fighting that he does with the heart and the mind and the body. And I think, wow, what an example. But I digress. We did this last week. And we looked at how he's remembering his wife as things are coming, uh, coming to an end. And he remembers Rachel giving birth. And he goes to bless the sons. And he blesses the sons. And he's, he seems to wake up. And he goes, wait, who are these kids? And he's in the middle of having a conversation. He goes, who are these that are here? Because he's blind, remember. And he only can attune himself to sound. And so apparently he hears the kids, you know, poking each other or whatever they're doing. And he sees them and he goes, well, come here so I can bless you. And he does. He brings them. And instead of the right hand, which is the one who would be blessed more because the right is just that way. Sorry, left-handed people. He switches his hands like this. And Joseph tries to tell him, no, 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 no. You got him wrong. You need to do it the other way. Now, you know, he's 137 years old. So people like that usually need a little bit of telling. You know, like. Uh, the milk's not in the stove, honey. It's, it's in the fridge. So we need to go, go over there. And so I think that's a little bit what Joseph is doing. But he knows exactly what he's doing. And he's now blessing the younger uh, over the older, which is not usually what they do. And he's passing on this wonderful blessing. And he speaks to them. And he just seems to have this really, really great heart. And he's just, uh, uh, when you read through some of these prayers, I, I think, man, what a, what a distracted heart I have sometimes. What a thankless heart I have for all the things that we take for granted. Uh, I had some serious computer issues this morning. And I had my hand in my face and I was calling out to God. And I was like, so that's what it takes is a computer <laughs> melting down. And I didn't think I would have the slides. And so that kind of puts me in a very awkward position. But luckily, I think the <laughs> Lord's hand was on it and it happened. But he goes and he blesses them and he's thankful for them. He tries to straighten them out and tell them he's doing the wrong thing. And it's not a wrong thing. It's the right thing. And he says, just listen. I know what I'm doing. Just hang in there. And we see that God blesses very often the younger over the older. He likes to step in and be God after all, even over our culture, over our habits, over Whatever it is that we think should be done, God likes to step in and rewrite those rules periodically, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. yep. So you thought you were going to church today <laughs> and maybe end up flat on your back. Or you thought you were going to church today and you ended up having an accident in the way. Sometimes God is, has his hand on all those things and he's working all those things together for good. And sometimes we don't see that. So he's... He's praying over them, and we see this with Cain and Abel, Ishmael and Isaac, Esau and Jacob. He blesses the younger over the elder, just like Reuben and Joseph got swapped because Joseph is getting a double blessing, and Reuben is the elder, but he's somewhat disqualified because of his actions, uh, which we, we talked about. I won't belabor the point. And it's interesting that there's this plot of ground that he says that he gives to Joseph or uh, Jacob gives to Joseph and we see later Jesus at this place uh, at Sychar having a conversation with a woman at the well and she knows that this is the land that was given to Joseph from Jacob and it's interesting how we can look forward into the New Testament and see how these landmarks and these things actually play themselves out into the New Testament so this week we're going to be in chapter 49 where he's going to say goodbye to all of his children. Verse 1, And Jacob called his sons, and he said, Gather together, that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Sometimes I feel like I can read just one verse, and I can probably preach on just that one verse. This is one of those. First of all, he says, I want you all together because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in the future. In the end times, you guys know what the end times are? Anytime after the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the end times. And we certainly are at the end of the end times. So Jacob is going to give them something personal, but he's going to give them something prophetic. 
which makes it a very difficult chapter. So bear with me and have an open mind as I speak through. He's got this personal prophetic message from them. Hebrews takes mention of this in Hebrews eleven twenty one. It says, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each one of his sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning on the top of his staff. It's the one thing that the New Testament author pulls out and says, this is something Jacob did by faith. Now, there were a whole bunch of things he did through fear, but this is one thing that was notable enough to be put in the New Testament. And so you go, okay, so now I'm ready. I'm ready to hear what in the world he has to say because he's going to speak about the future. He's not just going to be blessing his sons with blessings and praying God's protection on them, God's provision for them, that he might give them wisdom and strength and all of the things in which we might think a blessing contains. We're going to look at this and you're going to see something a little bit different than maybe what you might think. Notice his two names. Gather together and hear the O sons of Jacob and listen to Israel, your father. I hope you guys have been sensitive to note when Jacob is used or when Israel is used. And it's interesting. The same thing goes for Peter. If you remember, Jesus met Peter and he says, you were Simon Bar-Jonah, which means the son of Jonah. You will be called Peter. Peter, Simon. Instead of Simon, his name is Peter. And it's interesting, whenever he's pulling a bonehead move, he's called Peter. Or he's called Simon. You remember Jesus goes to him and says, Simon, Simon. And he has to use his name twice. It's a reminder that it's, he's still in the flesh. But anyway, be sensitive to that as you go through. And so Jacob is taking on both. I'm wondering, if you were to know the day of your death, what would you leave? What would you leave to your kids? What would you leave to your family? I mean, not your messy garage or, you know, your, your lucky penny or something. What are you going to leave that's a heritage that goes on beyond you? It's one of those things that, that I think about and I, I just wonder. Do you guys ever wonder about that? If you were gone today, what you would leave? Memories? Influence? It's good to think about. Verse 3, he's going to begin with Reuben. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power, unstable as water. You shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. So he calls his firstborn for a blessing. And does that sound like a blessing? Yes. Can you imagine? Dad says, yeah, I'd like to bless you. Come over here. You remember what you did 40 years ago? Yo, Dad, you still holding on to that? <laughs> By the way, it was 40 years previous to this. Reuben takes his wife, Bilhah, his stepmother, and has relations with her. And it wasn't his couch, it's actually his bed, but you know, you know the deal. And it was right after Rachel had died. It may have been a power play by Reuben to take control of the family and seize authority. And here's maybe the one wife that could give him some comfort after the death of Rachel, his favorite wife. And he takes that away because I don't know about you, but that probably would be the last time that dad ever had relations with that wife. And adultery is a really difficult thing to get over, isn't it? Because it tends to linger in the back of your mind and you, you wonder if somebody's willing to be intimate with somebody like that and, and they choose not me, well then, oh my goodness, how can I ever trust that person ever again? Or maybe not, maybe I'm completely wrong. Job chapter four, verse eight says, even as I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Basically it's, you reap what you sow, which plant in the ground is what's gonna come up. And Reuben is the firstborn, basically disqualifies himself from the double blessing and Joseph gets it. And Joseph is now going to be the blessed tribe through Ephraim and Manasseh and not Reuben. And Reuben gets kind of a tongue lashing here. 
And he goes, listen, you're my son. You're my strength. You're the first. You're the very first of, of my children. I'm so proud of you that you're my oldest, but you did a really stupid thing. And because of that, his, his blessing basically becomes a chastisement. So it's interesting because Israel as an individual, Reuben is his firstborn. And it's interesting, Israel as a nation, the first thing when they were newly born, when they came over the Red Sea and they got to the other side and they come up against Mount Sinai. It's a brand new world, right? They're not slaves anymore. And Moses says, listen, I got to go talk to God for you because you don't want to talk to him. You're all scared. So I'm going to go up and talk to him. I'll be back. And you remember what happens? You remember Charlton Heston coming down. I know you got it in your mind. Charlton Heston comes down and they don't do it justice what they're doing. They're having a wild party sexually around a golden calf. They're having a wild time. I find it interesting that Israel's first son commits adultery with his wife. And here Israel as a nation the first thing they do is they have this sexual indiscretion. And you're going to find how all of these things parallel each other all the way through. So Israel's first betrayal is sexual immorality. And Israel's first son has probably one of the worst things you can think of, sleeping with your mate. That's tough. So it's an interesting thing. You're going to see these things parallel throughout. And prophecies are like that. There's kind of a near and a far fulfillment of it. There's a, a here and now thing, but then there's also something that it points to. So I want you to be aware of that, okay? It's a little confusing and it's a little hard. And I'm sure I, I will have conversations with some of you later. But just keep an open mind and as we read through. So Reuben, his name means behold a son. And... Uh, he becomes a son of disappointment, really, because of everything that happened. But, uh, you know, don't feel too bad for him because they did name a sandwich after him. So this is, this is basically how it all breaks out. This is Reuben's territory down in here when they eventually go into the land. It's, it's one of the worst places. First of all, they're not on the right side of the Jordan uh, they didn't go over here and, and do all the work to, uh, you know, inhabit the land. They complained and they said, listen, this is good enough. We'd like to stay here. And so Reuben stays over there with half the tribe of Manasseh and Gad. And Reuben has this southern territory, which is always the first one to get invaded. So he puts himself in harm's way by staying on the worldly side of the Jordan, if you will. And so his, his choices are... Uh, his placement is not so blessed, just so that you understand. Moving on to Simeon and Levi. These are in order. He's going to mention his first four children in order. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Notice he pairs them together. He's trying to speed things along. Isn't that nice? Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their counsel. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. <laughs> I want nothing to do with you. For in their anger, they slew a man. And in their self-will, they have hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce. And their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. There you have the two names again. Thanks, Dad. So glad we came to this blessing <laughs> so we could hear exactly what's going on. But this is prophetic, remember? It's not just a personal thing. This is a prophetic thing. I mean, I, I wouldn't want my dad to give me that. I'd, I'd want something a whole lot more, but, but this is what they're getting. And he's pairing them up so the two of them are together. If you remember the rape of Dinah in chapter 34, their sister with Shechem, if you guys are familiar, remember going through chapter 34, we talked all about that. And basically, uh, he said he was in love with her, he wanted to marry her, and those boys concocted an idea. And they said, well, you know, we, 
we're not going to intermarry with you guys because, you know, you didn't nip the tip. You're not circumcised. So if you really want to do that, you all have to get circumcised. And they said, okay. So they all get circumcised, which shows some earnestness on their behalf to enter in, right? And they're, the people imagine, hey, listen, if we just do this thing, their stuff's going to be our stuff. Their women will be our women. All their cattle, it'll be ours. We're going to just swallow them up and incorporate them into our society. Well, Simeon and Levi had a different plan. And while they were still suffering and recovering, when they couldn't get up and fight, they went in and slaughtered every man in the city under the pretense of some religious binding together. Such a hypocrisy. And it's Simeon and Levi who do this together. They're the ones who head up, and then finally the other brothers follow up, and they're kind of collecting all that stuff. And you remember Jacob moans. He says, why did you do this to me? When they didn't do it to him, they did it to these men. And he says, now I have all this trouble. Everybody's going to hate me. I'm going to be like a stench in their nostrils. They're going to hunt me down and kill me like a dog. And it's like, okay, dad, you know, get over yourself already. But anyway, he says they're brutal. If you remember in chapter 34, it says, now it came to pass on the third day when they were in pain, that the two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took, each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the men, all the males, a whole city of men. And then they take their wives and children and possessions and they leave the place. So, yeah, these, these guys are, uh, you know, imagine having a couple of bikers walk through the door. That's what I imagine. It's just probably me. So Simeon and Levi are divided. He says that they'll be divided in Jacob because of their anger. It's interesting because Israel gets invaded twice, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom by Assyria and Babylon. And so they are divided, and it's, and it's interesting that they're divided two different times, and they're separated. If you know anything about Simeon, Simeon actually is right in the middle of Judah, and eventually once they separate, they don't call it, they call it Israel and Judah, even though Simeon's kind of like the donut hole right in the middle of Judah. So S Simeon just basically fades away into Judah. And then Levi, if you remember, Levi doesn't inherit land, right? You know what Levi inherits? The Lord is his inheritance, according to the scripture. And so they are the ones who go into the priesthood because a couple of Levites do some good things a little bit later on when there's a plague and they actually earn the right and they, they get commendated and said, okay, well, you guys are going to be the priesthood. And that happens later on. So it's interesting, Simeon and Levi are divided, and they're divided uh, as Israel is divided north and south, and then eventually they're taken over by another nation. And so it's two times that it happens, and it's not probably an accident that he's taking these two and talking about how they are and then saying there's going to be a division. I just find that very interesting, don't you? What a great coincidence that Jacob is saying these things. Verse 8, Judah. You're going to hear a lot about Judah. You know why you hear a lot about Judah? Judah is the predecessor of Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's why. And there are prophecies about Judah that there would be a Messiah that would come from Judah. So we hear a lot about Judah on purpose. And it's funny, all of this was written before Jesus ever showed up, just so you know. This was good, a good 1,600 years difference between the coming of Jesus Christ and this prophecy. So anybody who says, well, I don't know, you don't, don't you think that this book was written by man? Well, in, in that a letter that you send out is written by your computer, well, no, no, I, I actually wrote it. I just use a computer. Okay, so you understand. If you got a handwritten letter, was it the pen that wrote that letter? Well, in a sense, it may be, but it certainly was you, right? And so God works through people and moves them along to write the scriptures. And you can tell this because all of the prophecies that were made happen. So it's, it's a very simple thing. And if you have an open mind and you look, it's, it's really easy. But here... 
Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. You guys remember what Judah means? It means praise. This is a little play on words here. But it's interesting because he doesn't get this double blessing, does he? It's actually Joseph that does. But he says, your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. That's very curious, isn't it? And to him, apparently Shiloh's a him, shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. And I know what you're thinking. What's this dude on? This is some crazy psychedelic stuff going on. How many of you are confused? I'm so glad that I came today and that the computer works. So, Judah means praise. And this speaks of a delivered people, that Israel would be a delivered people. It speaks of a deliverer here in this passage. It's speaking forward, and we understand it as Jesus Christ, the Mashiach, Nagiv, the prince who is the Messiah. And so as we look, he calls him a lion. If, if you could read that small lettering, you would see that Jesus is called the lion of Judah in the book of Revelation. Jesus is the lion of Revelation. And here he is being called a lion way back here 1,600 years before he shows up. I find that very interesting. And the more that you look at prophetic words, the more interesting you see overlap into the New Testament, things you already know about, about Jesus. So we'll pick it apart. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. It's speaking forward to Jesus Christ, by the way. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies, because he defeated death and the grave, did he not? Your father's children shall bow down before you. Wait a minute, I thought that was Joseph's vision. It was Joseph's vision. But he's not talking about that. He's talking about Jesus the Christ. Judah is a lion's whelp. So he talks about a young lion. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. So it's talking about his origin. He bows down and he lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? You'll notice this procedure from a young lion to a middle-aged lion to an old lion that lies down. His business is taken care of and nobody messes with him. That sounds a lot like what Jesus did, doesn't it? Isn't he seated on the right hand of the Father? Yes, sir. He's a, it's done. And who's going to rouse him? Nobody. So it's interesting. So we talk about this leader that's going to come. Somebody that would lead, and we see Jesus selected, hand-picked his 12 disciples, even the one that would betray him, and he led people. Remember when he fed over 5,000 people in one shot, Jesus was a leader of men, and people followed him, but he also let them know what was required to follow his leadership. And it was amazing, because as soon as Jesus starts telling them what it takes, they all go away except for the 12. It's almost like he knew. That's a joke. But Jesus leads by serving, doesn't he? He demonstrates this by washing the disciples' feet at the Lord's Supper. If you remember, they have supper, they have Passover. Usually you wash up before supper, right? Well, Jesus goes around and washes their feet after supper because nobody washed their feet. And it never says anything about who washed Jesus' feet. Jesus leads by example. Jesus leads by serving. And so he does, even though he is the Lion of Judah. Children would come to him, and he would hold them. And the disciples even said, oh, oh, give the Messiah some room. Back off, people. And Jesus said, let the little children come to me, because such is the kingdom of heaven. And he would put them on his lap, and he would hold them. And he would spend time with them. I'm sure he spoke with them, and he showed love to them. Here's somebody who's a leader. Here's somebody who knows what it is to lead. Jesus was a leader. But he's also the Lion of Judah. He's the ferocious one, and he will be the one who judges us at the great white throne. 
judgment. The second half, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. You know what a scepter is, right? A, a scepter is something which is a signal of rule. It's, it's to show that you're in control. If, uh, if you had an accident on the highway and somebody got out of the car and they were holding a baseball bat, that would tell you something. Yo, 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 wait, 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 wait. <laughs> a scepter is a symbol of authority. It's a, a symbol of power. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. You know where King David was from? Judah. The scepter, meaning law. Nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. The base for Shiloh is actually shalom, which is peace. It's one who brings peace. The prince of peace, if you will. And him shall be obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine. You guys bind your donkey to the vine? Okay. And his donkey's called to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine. Now, why would you do that? And his, glow, his clothes in the blood of grapes. It's interesting. When we take communion, we take the blood of grapes, do we not? Yeah. And it's a symbol of what? Blood. The blood of Jesus Christ that was sacrificed for our sins. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Speaking of a scepter, symbol of authority. In 12 AD, Josephus writes that the Romans came in and they had already subjugated Israel. And they had allowed them their own rule to do whatever they wanted to do. In 12 AD, they came and they took away from them the right to capital punishment. Capital punishment is an example of how you have absolute authority. You go to the nth degree to enforce a law. They actually still have capital punishment in this country. Did you know that? Hopefully not in your home, but in this country. It's a sign that you have absolute rule and control. And the rabbis ran throughout the streets of Jerusalem. They tore their clothes. They threw ash on their head. And they said, God has lied. The scripture has failed because this scripture says that the scepter will not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. Until the Messiah comes to deliver his people, you will have rule, self-governance in your land. That day they lost it. And they said, God's word has been broken. The scepter has been removed from us. It's interesting. You can read it in Josephus. It happens in 12 AD. But what they didn't know is in a carpenter shop, not far from there was a little boy who's Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God, who is Shiloh, who has come. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. It's interesting that Jesus was 12 years old in the book of Luke, and it's the only account that we have about Jesus' youth. But we know that he was in Jerusalem, probably the very day that this announcement was made. The scepter will not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. And Jesus was there. What a coincidence. And Jesus stunned all of the Pharisees as he explained to them the scriptures. And they're like, how does he know all this? It's easy when he's the author, right? And they astounded him. And that's where they find three days later, that's where they found him. No coincidence it was three days later either. Or maybe it was. So Judah, Judah is speaking of deliverance. And so this prophecy is given about Judah that he's going to come a leader, a lion, somebody who's going to be Lord in control and that he would be a landowner. Actually, that he would possess the land. If you remember the book of Revelation, there was a scroll that had to be opened. And John himself wept that there was no one worthy to open the scroll. It's the title deed of the earth, by the way. It's written on the inside and on the outside. And there was no one worthy to open the scroll. Except one of the angels said, hey, look. The lion of the tribe of Judah, he's worthy to open the scroll. And it looks like a lamb that was slaughtered. And yet he was a lion. 
all this prophetic conversation about lions and lambs in these pictures. This is how God speaks to us, right? Through pictures and forms. He speaks of how he's going to take his animal and put it to a vine. By the way, a vine was always pictured. Israel was always a vine. And having an animal that you could put to the vine, that whole picture that it paints is this picture of somebody who owns the land. Do you realize that Jesus now has not just made a down payment, but he bought the right to our souls. Amen. And we come into that when we accept him as our Lord. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 13, this description of Jesus Christ, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the word of God. Any question as to who that is? We have the same picture here long before Jesus ever shows up, at least 1,600 years before, that Jesus would have a robe that looks like it was dipped in wine. It was dipped in blood. And it says here in Revelation 1.14 that his eyes were like a flame of fire. It's interesting. If you find all these things in the Old Testament and you do some research, you'll find that they carry all the way through because this is how God speaks to us, right? Verse 13, Zebulun. I'm not sure I would step up if dad was giving out these sort of blessings until after, you know, Judah was pretty good. I'll take that. Zebulun shall dwell in a haven by the sea. He shall become a haven for ships and his border shall adjoin Sidon. It's interesting because if you look at Zebulun's territory, he's between two bodies of water. There's the Sea of Galilee and here's the Mediterranean. Zebulun is between the two. And it's basically, he's, he's going to go out, he's going to go out and uh, disperse and be divided. So he's going to get in these, these ships and go over. And there's a lot of conversation, uh, not much of it relevant about the lost 10 tribes of Israel and all kind of bananas. They are scattered throughout and it's going to be really hard to find them at this point. They get dispersed and they get exiled and so it's hard to find anybody that can prove that they're from that tribe. That's why you have a lot of that going on in the scriptures with the names upon names. It's so that you could prove your lineage. Issachar is a strong donkey. Thanks, Dad. Issachar is a strong donkey lying down between two burdens. He saw that rest was good and that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden and became a band of slaves. Remember we looked at the beginning. And how the timeline of Israel. Actually follows each one of these sons. Every one of these blessings. Follows the history of Israel. And I didn't bring that out. As we zipped through. Because I'm looking at the time. They're going to be prospered. And persecuted. This is speaking of what happened to the Jews that you might be aware of with Nazi Germany. If you remember in 1929 when everything kind of melted down um, with the Great Depression, it made an availability for um, Nazi power to take over in the invasion of the world. And the Jews, it was considered a Jewish problem. In fact, if you read any of the writings, you'll see that that's what it's about. If you look back, you can, you can go back from here into the 1700s and the Jews had proliferated and gone throughout the world. And people like Russia were trying to figure out what to do with them. And they put them in ghettos in a place called Apel, where you were only able to live there if you were Jewish. And they were persecuted and they were made to be slaves all at this time. So if you go back to the czars and you go back to Nicholas and all of these folks that you're probably aware of if you know history, they, pros they persecuted the Jews. They were only able to go to certain places. They regulated them so that they couldn't have certain businesses. And yet they were prosperous. And they had lots of children and they made lots of money. And they said, how are we going to control these people? And they made them slaves. Zebulun is that part of the history in which I believe he's referring to here. So Issachar gets exploited. Even though they're prospered and they do well, they're taken as slaves. And we can see this historically as it comes down. Are you guys following all of this? Because I'm zipping through it really fast. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent, by the way. I don't know. Whenever you hear serpent, you think good thing? No herpetologists? A viper by the path that bites the horse's heels 
so that its rider shall fall backward. I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. You get Jacob's in the middle of, of saying all this, and he's just like, so he's like, Lord, I'm ready to go home already, in the middle of speaking about Dan. It doesn't sound really good about Dan, does it? He's a viper, by the way, and he's going to strike at the horse's heels, and it's going to throw the rider off. You get all of this analogy, and you say, what in the world could that be talking about? Well, in Jeremiah, there's, there's also some allusion here to it in chapter 8, 16, and 17. The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. Interesting, there's a horse. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones. For they have come and devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those who dwell in it. For behold, I will send serpents among you. Imagine that. Vipers, which cannot be charmed, and they shall bite you, says the Lord. So we've got horses and vipers that are included here. What in the world could that possibly mean? Well, I know of the great serpent who is Satan who will eventually be put down. And apparently, Dan is going to be working for the wrong team. There are lots of rabbis and lots of research that you can do. There are people that believe that the, the Antichrist who's to come is going to come out of the tribe of Dan, that he will be from that tribe. It also lends itself to be true. If you look in the book of Revelation in chapter 7, you don't find the book of Dan listed in the 12 tribes of Israel. So whatever you see, whenever you read through and you see something missing, you should raise a question. Why? Dan was one of the first places where idolatry came in. They were all the way at the northern section of Israel, and they were the first ones to bring idolatry in. If you remember, they, they had a place up there that you could go and worship instead of going to Jerusalem. They set up their own place all the way up in Dan and Beersheba. In Daniel 11.37 he shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above them all. He's talking about the Antichrist, which fits in very nicely with this passage, doesn't it? What does it mean that he, he won't have the desire of women? That's a good question, isn't it? I find that very interesting, especially with the weird world we live in. So, in Revelation 7, the tribe of Dan is not mentioned, which is rather interesting. And so, Dan represents a poisoned people. So, you see these protected people, you see these divided people, and now you see a poisoned people. And I believe this speaks of the time that has yet to come when the Antichrist will be revealed, and all of Israel will follow him. All of the Jews are going to dig this guy. But at one point in the middle of this tribulation, he's going to put himself in the temple, which means the temple will have to be rebuilt. And he's going to demand to be worshipped like God. And all the Jews are going to go, oi. They're going to get it. It's not him. And they're going to come to understand that Jesus Christ is the one who came for them and that they missed it. They missed their appointment. Verse 19, Gad a troop shall trample upon him. You remember what Gad means? It means a troop. Gad, a troop shall trample upon him, and he shall triumph at last. Bread from Asher shall be rich, and he shall yield royal dainties. Naphtali is a deer let loose. He uses beautiful words. Now he's coupling three at once. And aren't you glad he gave us all this information? Imagine the hardship that your pastor has trying to find out what in the world all this means. Well, it's interesting because if you, if you think about it, if the Antichrist is revealed, what's the next thing? The Jews themselves are going to recognize him and follow him, but then they're going to say no. They're going to say, aha, you're not the guy. And suddenly there are going to be people that are getting killed left and right. And there'll be, a, there'll be a bunch of them that get beheaded that sit underneath an altar, and you guys can read it in Revelation. So they're going to become slaves, which is the very next thing. So God says that you'll be trampled under, but you will prevail. But you will prevail. In Jeremiah 49.1, it says, Against the Amorites, thus says the Lord, has Israel no sons? Has he no heir? Why then does Malcolm inherit Gad 
and his people dwell in its cities. He's talking about the downfall of this tribe that will be taken down uh, eventually by the Antichrist as a prophetic word. Psalm 137, verses 2 to 4. If uh, you remember the captivity of Israel, this is one of the Psalms during the captivity. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For those who carried us away captive asked us for a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, sing us one of those songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? You should pick up the sorrow of that. This is a subjugated people who are enslaved. And they're like, these people want to hear us sing one of the songs of Zion. That's like throwing you in jail and saying, let's hear one of your worship tunes, dude. I'm sorry, my heart's just not in it. My heart's just not in it. And I think that's what's going to happen. And it's interesting because God uses difficult times like that to wake us up, doesn't he? I think some of us need more of those slaps in the face to get to a place of intimacy with God. Some of us need it more than others. I probably have experienced more than the usual. So Gad is this troop. He shall triumph at last. Bread from Asher shall be rich, and he shall yield royal dainties. It's interesting. Asher is the most blessed of sons. Let him be favored by his brothers. And here's an interesting term. And let him dip his foot in oil. I've dipped my foot in oil, and it ruined my sneaker. <laughs> what, the, what this is referring to is olive oil, and it's talking about uh, great wealth. Somebody who sticks their foot in oil and is, is getting a, a, a foot massage, if you will, and a foot washing and a, a conditioning of the foot, which in open toe sandals really takes a beating, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a particular phrase of uh, extreme wealth. And so they're, they're speaking of Asher being protected and being provided for. If any of you recognize that place over there from Indiana Jones, that is the uh, city called Petra is the stone city of Petra. And just to give you an idea of the scale of this thing, that's a hot air balloon. And that little teeny basket on the bottom is full of people. So that's how big it is. I, I thought it was like, you know, like walking into a museum or, you know, walking into a library, but it's massive. Um, it, it speaks of them being protected, that Asher would flee. And uh, the scriptures actually direct the people that when you see these things happen, you run to the hill, Jesus said so that you can be protected. So Asher, his name means happy, and it turns out that he will be protected, that God will protect him. So this is that stage of, of Israel's history as well. And then the last one, Naphtali, is a deer let loose. He uses beautiful words. Naphtali, I believe, is speaking of these 144,000. You guys know who the 144,000 are in the book of Revelation? These are going to be these Jewish evangelists who will be speaking about the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. And they're going to give their lives because they do that. And they're going to use beautiful words. They're going to use everything that they have to win them over. It's interesting, uh, Jesus we see in chapter 4, Matthew leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. So if ever you want to know if the Old Testament is, is saying what you think it's saying, you can always usually check the New Testament. And uh, that's, that's usually a good check. But Naphtali is a place that is going to be said that there is going to be light that comes. Certainly it did when Jesus came, but it will also happen in the region of Israel again in the end times when they preach about Jesus Christ. And Joseph, we finally get to Joseph. He's the good son. Everybody likes him. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough at a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him and hated him. I got a question. When did archers shoot at Joseph? That's how you know it's prophetic. 
because it didn't happen to him individually. This is now a prophetic thing speaking of Israel. Because you go, what? What? Shot at him and hated him. We've, we've seen through here, and I've, I've probably given you at least 100 examples of how Jesus is a foreshadowing of Jesus. <laughs> you forgot Jesus. You forgot. Jesus. He, he's hated by his brothers, right? He's rejected by his brothers the first time. The second time he's received, right? Or he receives his brothers. We, anyway. So Joseph is a picture of Jesus. So it very well could be they're speaking about Jesus. Let's put that into the equation and think about it. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. That sounds a lot like what Jesus went through uh, in a euphemistic sense. But his bow remained in strength, and his ar the arms of his hands were made strong. By hands, the mighty God of Jacob, interesting, changes the terms, from there is the shepherd of the stone of Israel. Now we start to see Jesus, don't we? He's the stone that the builders rejected, right? He's the stone of Israel. In fact, they're using all of this and calls him the mighty God, the shepherd. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for a sheep, doesn't he? All of these things point to Jesus. You guys getting this? Okay. The stone of Israel. By the God of your father who will help you and by the almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb. The blessing of your father has excelled the blessings of my ancestors. How does his blessing bless his ancestors? Up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. He was separate from his brothers. Joseph was separated from his brothers just as Jesus was separated from us. And he goes for a little time. He goes to prepare a place for us. You guys get that, right? Yeah. It's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus all throughout here. So Joseph represents the second coming, I believe. In the timeline of Israel, the very next thing is the second coming of Jesus Christ. So I believe Joseph is speaking of the millennium. It's interesting how in, there'll be one angel who comes and binds up Satan for a thousand years. It's going to bind him up. And then he's going to get released at the end and test mankind. And guess what we do? We blow it again. Just as though you didn't know that we would do that. And then the Lord takes control and he shuts everything down and he starts all over with a new heavens and a new earth and it's all, and it's all over. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. Thanks, Dad. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he shall devour his prey and at night he shall divide the spoil. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel and this is what their father spoke to them. And he blessed them. He blessed each one according to his own blessing. Interesting. Benjamin represents that remnant which is going to be saved, and I believe that will be through the thousand-year millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And so you can see step by step, Jacob is prophesying into his sons things that don't apply to them, that are not personal to them, but it's going to be to Israel as a nation. And it's just a, it's just a fascinating thing when you get into... Um, any of the prophecies, and it can, it can make you a little crazy and scratch your head until you start flipping pages. And then he, chained, he charged them, and he said to them, I am to be gathered to my people, bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought in the field of Ephron the Hittite as a possession for a burial place. So he's giving instructions as to where he should be buried. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife, and they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is there were purchased from the sons of Heth. And when Jacob had finished commending his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. I find it interesting that he expends himself at the very end, speaking all of these things by faith, God giving him insight, 
and suddenly he's gone. He draws his feet back up into bed, which means he's leaning on his staff. He's sitting on his deathbed. He's blessing his sons. He lets go of the staff. He draws his feet up into the bed, curls his knees into his chest, takes a breath, and he's gone. I, I just find that very noble. I would like to go that way. Make sure I expended myself to the very end doing what the Lord would have me do. And then say, I'm coming home. And so this is a picture, actually, of his, where he's buried. And that's all you'll see if you go there, by the way. Uh, they, have a, they have a Jewish side and they have a Muslim side because they both honor Abraham and Sarah and those descendants. And so you can view it from either side, but you don't want, you can't switch sides. There'll be a lot of trouble if you do that. So this is all you're going to see. This is actually what it looks like inside. And this is the sarcophagus with uh, uh, something over the top of it. You can actually get pictures of what it looks like inside, but you can't go in there. It's locked up tight and it's guarded. So this is where he decided to be buried, along with Abraham and Sarah and uh, Isaac and Rebecca and his wife, Leah, which was really his second choice, wasn't it? But it's interesting because the Messiah comes through Leah. So God does work all things together for good, doesn't he? So next week, we're going to look at the burial of Jacob. And that will be the end of the book of Genesis. So it ends on a very complex note uh, with lots of things. I would encourage you guys to read, as I, I ask the worship team to come up, I would encourage you guys to read through that section again. Be a Berean. See if these things are not true. And look through the word for yourself and enjoy some of these interesting things. I didn't go into all of it, and I had lots of passages from Numbers and Deuteronomy, and I, I didn't want to bog you guys down like it's a, a college course. But I wanted you to see some of the beauty of the scriptures which are preserved that we can see God's hand truly was there. And this is no accident.